Well, hey, welcome to the message. Here at Colonial Church, we're all about loving God, loving people, and loving life. We pray that this message would be practical and inspiring for you in your everyday life. God bless you. All right, Matthew 25. I'm going to get straight into the Word this morning as I position my pulpit. Hopefully you brought your Bibles, but if you didn't, that's okay. We'll put it up on the wall for your viewing pleasure. But in Matthew 25, Jesus is telling a story. This is actually the 11th time in the Gospel of Matthew where he says these words. He says, for the kingdom of heaven is like. And it's amazing because whenever Jesus says that, the Son of God says that, that ought to make us sit up a little. That ought to be the type of thing where we sit up and say, whoa, 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 I need to hear this because this could be important, and I believe this is. So I'm going to read it this morning in Matthew 25 from the Message Translation. And I love this because anytime you want to just see something from a different angle, um, definitely a contemporary angle, the Message is a great place to go. But I'm going to read it from the Message just because it speaks so well to this series that we're in. But it says this, It's also like a man going off on an extended trip. He calls his servants together and delegated responsibilities. To one he gave 5,000, to another 2,000, to a third 1,000. Depending on their abilities, then he left. Right off, the first servant went to work and doubled his master's investment. The second did the same. But the man with a single thousand dug a hole and carefully buried his master's money. After a long absence, the master of those three servants came back and settled up with them. The one given 5,000 showed him how he had doubled his investment and the master commended him and said, good work, you did your job well. From now on, be my partner. The servant with the 2,000 showed him how he also had doubled his master's investment and his master commended him, commended him, said, good work, you did your job well. From now on, be my partner. And then he gets to the last servant. He says, the servant who gave 1,000 said, master, I, I know you to have high standards and hate careless ways. Sounds like God to me. That you demand the best and you make no allowances for error. I was afraid I might disappoint you. So I found a good hiding place and secured your money. Here it is, safe and sound, down to the last cent. Look at the response. The master was furious. That's a terrible way to live. It's criminal to live cautiously like that. If you knew I was after the best... Why did you do less than the least? The least you could have done would have been given, have been to invest them with the sum with the bankers, where at least I would have gotten a little interest. Take the thousand, give it to the one who risks the most, and get rid of this play it safe who won't go out on a limb. Throw him into the utter darkness. It's an amazing story. So many different layers to it, so many different amazing things to it. And I really believe it's powerful for the series. That we're in. So I want to preach a message this morning. If you're taking notes, you can write the title down. The title of this message, part four of the series manager that we're in, is this, Double or Nothing. Double or Nothing. Would you pray with me? Lord, we just thank you, Father, for the opportunity again to be in your house. Lord, to be your children in your house, Lord. We know so, so much so, Lord, you love to hear your children in your house. Father, we just thank you that that's what church is, Lord. It's your children coming home to you, being in your house, in your home. And Father, we just thank you for your word this morning. Thank you that it brings life. It breathes life into our situation, our season. It's always got something to say to us. Father, thank you that it's your breath on a page. And Holy Spirit, we're grateful that you're here right now. Minister to us. Help us to see things more clearly. And Father, we just thank you for colonial kids and all the colonial kids and everything that's going on in there. Lord, thank you that you're building their little spirits even right now, and a faith-filled colonial church said with me, amen. So we're in a series called Manager. I love this series. It's all about stewardship. Stewardship of God-given resource. And I came up with a definition, sort of a description a few weeks back, and we're going to put it up on the screen again, but this is the first uh, that I came up with when it relates to stewardship, because stewardship and management are interchangeable as words in the, in the Bible. The first is this, the wise and effective management of the God-given resources in your life. That's stewardship. But I came up with another definition that I believe speaks to this passage that we're in in Matthew 25. You can put that up as well. But it's to manage and to grow the resources of another. If you want to know what 
stewardship is. And if that's what we're reading, if we're looking at today, it's to manage, it's to take care of, it's to, to steward. But God is saying it's also to grow. To grow what he's given us and what he's allowed us to have. So quick, three quick uh, observations from this passage. You can do things a little different this morning. I've got some, some practical things I, I would love to, to show you this morning. But three quick observations about this passage. And hopefully already, you're already inserting yourself into the storyline. You're already in, in, seeing God in, in, in his way, but also putting yourself in the story as well. But a couple of observations. The first is this. God has gifted you with something. Make no mistake today, God has gifted you something. Look at what it says. It says, He called His servants together and delegated responsibilities. To one He gave 5,000, to another 2,000, to a third 1,000, depending on their abilities. And it says, and then He left. I don't know about you, but that sort of sounds like the world we live in right now. That Jesus has come, and then He's left. He's gone. But what do we know to be true, friends? We know He's coming again. He's coming back. But God has given you something now. He's gifted you with something. He's given you a life to live. He's given something to you. Something to take care of. Something to be a steward of. Something to manage. So that's the first observation. The second observation is this. God expects you to do something with it. God expects you to do something with what he has given you. What does it say? It says, to the third of thousands. So he gave them all responsibilities. He delegated the talents to them. Look at what it says. It says, depending on their abilities. He expects you to do something with it. It's a double or nothing deal. He wants you to do something with it. And here's the truth, friend. He's expecting a return. He's expecting something to come back. He said to the the servant that he gave 5,000 to, he said, good work. When he saw that he doubled his investment, he said, good work, you did your job well. From now on, be my partner. See, this is specifically talking, this this passage is specifically talking about money. It's talking about money, but God is saying, on what I've allowed to come into your life, your increase, I'm expecting a return. He wants to see a return on what he's allowed us to have. He wants to see a return on that investment, an ROI, return on investment in your world, in your life. What he's allowed to go in, he wants to see the return that comes back. So that's the second thing. He expects you to do something with it. But here's the the third thing. The third observation from this passage is so cool. He's going to ask you how you did with it. He's going to ask you how you did with it. This is a cool thought, but one day you're going to settle accounts with the master. One on one. He's going to sit down with you. He's going to invite you to take a seat. He's going to invite you to sit down. He's going to open up the books. He's going to ask you to open them up, and he's going to ask you this question. So how did we do? How'd you make out? How did it go? Tell me about it. How'd you go? How'd you make out? What's the return look like? So he's going to ask you how you did. And God is calling us to be faithful stewards of that which he has given us, management. Management in the kingdom of God. It's kind of like when someone allows you to have something of theirs to use. I don't know if someone's ever graciously allowed you to stay maybe in their vacation condo or you need to borrow someone's truck one time. But I believe God's calling us all to be those type of people that don't want to just give it back the way we got it. Yeah. Right. No, no, give it back in better condition than we found it. Right. It's the same with your life. If I borrow someone's truck, I don't want to just give them back the same amount of gas. I want to go and fill the whole tank up and then take it to the, the, the cleaner. Make it look better than it was when I took it on. And it's the same thing with our lives and God is calling us to this greater level of stewardship. So I want to be a bit more practical today. So I've got seven questions. Seven questions that every wise, faithful manager should ask themselves. You ready? Question number one is this. What am I believing for? What am I believing for? So what do I have now? But what am I believing God's going to give me? What am I believing will be the increase in our life? We're not told about the first two servants, you know, the big money guy and then the little money guy. 
You know, the 5,000, the 2,000, we're not told about, uh, in, in the scriptures, we're not told what kind of dreams or aspirations they had, but you just get this sense from the passage that they just went on and just made it happen. They had aspirations, they had dreams, they wanted to create something, they wanted to build something in life. So you've got to ask yourself the question, what am I believing for? Like, what has God given me now? But what am I believing he's going to give me in the future? Because this is the key and this is why it will make sense. I've got to understand if I believe for something greater down the future, that means I've got to know how to steward it now. Because when I get there and I find myself in a position where, oh man, I have so much, it's great, but I don't know how to steward it, you're going to be in trouble. So what am I believing for that I can begin to put practices and stewardship in place now to manage it well then? Stewardship is not just for today, it's for tomorrow as well. Stewardship is also for tomorrow. See, his master commended him. The, the two that did good, he, that, that, he commended him. He said, good work. You did your job well. He said, from now on, be my partner. So wait a minute. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I, I did the job. I got the return. And the master says, now be my partner. So you're saying as a partner, I'm now at the, board, the boardroom table? And at the boardroom table, I'm, I'm, I'm being asked to make big decisions? And I have to, to be responsible for the allocation of capital. I have to be the person that makes the big decisions about real estate. I'm now a partner in the firm. Wow. I've then got to steward that. Yeah. So it's not just doing the job, but God's calling you to a higher place. Right. What am I believing for? Therefore, I know what I need to go and steward. It's the same with our church. You know, When we started our church, I think from like day one, I believed that our church would have this and, and more. But can I just encourage you that, that back then we started to think and steward like we had this back then? Does that make sense? So I believe a good steward says there's more coming for me. So what do I need to do now to make sure when I get there, everything's going to be great? So what am I believing for? That's question number one. Question number two is this, what's my roadmap to get there? What's my roadmap to get there? You know, I think it's interesting that the five talent guy, you know, the big money guy, the one that doubled the big money, the big money, he was a big money guy. But I find it interesting that they didn't waste any time. Look at what it says. It says, then the master left and said, right off, the first servant went to work and doubled his master's investment. It's almost like he just, he just knew what to do. He had a roadmap. He had a plan. He knew where to go. He knew what to do. He knew who he needed to go and see to make it happen. He had a roadmap. And we need to ask ourselves, what's my roadmap to get where I believe God wants me to go? See, here's the truth. The roadmap is not a roadblock. Well, let me say it this way. A budget is not a dead end. It's actually an interchange that leads you to a better life. You get that sense that the, the one talent wonder, Mr. One Talent Only, it's like he just kind of stood there and he said, oh, I don't have a plan. I, I don't have a roadmap. I'm going to make excuses. I don't really know what to do here. So I'm going to choose to fear and I'm just going to put it in the ground. But it sounds like he did not have a plan. He didn't have a plan. You just get this sense that he had no roadmap and no plan at all. I shared a story last week about my dad, and I thought of another one this week. Was, he had a profound impact, impact on my life and showed me some cool things. And I remember times, every times I'd sort of just, you know, throw my dreams at my dad. You know, I'd just say, Dad, I'm going to do this. And sons have a way of doing that with their dad, being completely unrealistic and, you know, just saying all these are crazy things, and dads have an amazing way of bringing sons back down to earth sometimes. But I said, you know, dad, I used to be a swimmer. I said, dad, I'm going to win medals. I'm going to win medals. And he would look at me and say, that's really nice, Matthew. That's great. But how are you going to do it? How is it going to happen? What's your plan? He used to say this all the time. He'd say, failing to plan is planning to fail. So in effect, if you don't have a plan, what you're doing is you're planning to fail. Over and over, what's the roadmap? Where's the plan? 
Show me the pathway. But a roadmap is not a roadblock, and a budget is not a dead end. And having a plan in place, I believe, is the key to seeing success in your finances, in, in the area of life that, that you want to go, you want to see God do things. I've had the privilege with some of our young leaders to sit down and, and help them establish just a basic budget. Some of our young guys that are you know, now starting families and building lives, and it's, it's awesome. I love it because I used to be in that place. It wasn't that long ago. But I love sitting down and just establishing the basics. And um, I always say the same, this same thing to every single one of them. I say, you know, we can have the greatest budget in the world. Like I'm talking like layers and layers and layers of just amazing looking stuff. Formulas in a spreadsheet for days. Formulas and man, you can highlight columns and you can have, you can have bold and italics and you can have just... I mean, you can have a spreadsheet that looks amazing. But if you have that budget and that spreadsheet and that plan, but you don't follow it, you ain't going anywhere in life. You've got to stick to it. And to stick to it means I need to have discipline and consistency, and I've got to keep coming back to it over and over again. I tell some of our guys, you've got to come back to it and make sure it still looks good in the next season of life. You can't just build it one time and do away with it. It doesn't work that way. You've got to have a roadmap, and the roadmap you've got to stick to to move forward. So question number two was, what's my roadmap? Question number three that a good, wise manager should ask when thinking about a return is this. Is it wise to do this? Is this a wise thing to do? Well, let me say it this way. Am, am I letting wisdom speak loudly right here? See, I, I, I told our church a couple, weeks, uh, a couple months ago that I love to start my day in Proverbs. It's just something I learned from my pastor. There's 30, 31 Proverbs, roughly the same amount of days in a month, so I always just start there. Whatever day it is, the proverb, I start there, and then I move on to other parts of the Bible. It's great. Always just done it. It's routine. I love it. But I've found that now my life is defaulted in wisdom. It's just that's where I'm based, and I love it. But wisdom has a call. Wisdom actually speaks in our lives. Let me show it to you. It's in the first proverb, the first chapter in Proverbs. Verse 20 says, Wisdom cries aloud in the street. In the markets, she raises her voice. At the head of the noisy street, so in the noisy world that we live in today, with all the chaos and all the all the online craziness and all the all the noise, it says she cries out at the entrance of the city gates, she speaks. And it goes on in this proverb. You can read it um, maybe this week, but it goes on in this proverb and talks about how if wisdom isn't heard and, 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 and received and put into our lives, then we can find ourselves in a place where calamity comes upon us and things don't work out good because we've ignored wisdom. But look what it says in verse 32. After all that, it says, But for the simple are killed by their turning away. So their, their ignorance of wisdom, they're turning away from from, um, from what God says, and the complacency of fools destroys them. But look at verse 33. But whoever listens to me will dwell secure and will be at ease and without dread of disaster. Wisdom has a call. Wisdom, wisdom speaks and can speak loudly in our lives. Just a quick story, but the other day I went to Alvin's Island for the very first time. And wisdom was speaking loudly, but I didn't listen. I went in there without any reinforcements. I went in there by myself with three children. God bless you. If, if you own Alvin's Island, God bless you. I love you. I'm grateful for you. It's a great store, I'm sure. But man, I was in over my head. I went in there and immediately, Jack just, I lost my son, Jack, five years old, and he's just gone. It's a huge story. I had no idea where he was. I was freaking out, but wisdom was speaking loudly. said, don't go in there. <laughs> don't do it. And then he got to this point where he, he could see the sheer terror on my face, and he thought it was a game. And so he just took off again. My daughter's at the counter trying to buy stuff. It was a mess. I wasn't listening to wisdom. But wisdom can speak loudly in your life. Wisdom can be the voice that goes above other voices because wisdom can, can say things like this to stewards and managers can say, you don't really need this. 
can say this will actually affect more than just you in a negative way. Wisdom will say this, you can't afford this. You can't do this. But wisdom will also be the voice that speaks loudest when you should do something. Wisdom will say something like this, this is actually a good investment. Wisdom will say, now this is right. It's the right time to do this. Wisdom will say, this is something that you can do. Wisdom will say, this does financially make sense. Wisdom will tell you, this is a smart call. This is not a smart call. So am I allowing wisdom to speak loudly? Is it wise to do this? A great question. The next question, question number four. Oh, this is a good one. Do I need help? Do I need help? See, a good steward knows when he or she need to bring in some heavier artillery, some greater expertise, someone who knows a little more. And it's interesting to me that the master here actually talks about help. It's in here. Let me show it to you. He's talking about the least. He's speaking to the lazy steward. In the New King James, it calls him a lazy, wicked steward. Pretty full on. This is a master speaking to him. He said, the least you could have done would have been to invest the sum with the bankers. When at least I would have gotten a little interest. This says to me that there was help available. That there is help available. See, he's saying you could have at least taken that sum, given it to the people who know what they're doing, that have the expertise. You could have gone and found help and you could have brought a return to me. Are we asking for help? Do I need help? Do I not know everything? Here's a tip. If you work in the construction industry, you might not be the best stock trader. And if you're in full-time ministry like me, you might not be the best at building a house. Do I need help? Do I need someone to help me with their resources? Are there other people that have expertise that I can lean on? I believe so much in building a team around you. In life. And I've learned this as as I've got older is I don't know how to do everything. I don't know how to figure it out. And I used to be in this mindset. I used to have a stingy mindset where I'd just be like, I don't don't want to pay for all that. I don't want to. I'll just figure it out by myself. I've got YouTube and Google. I'm good. But as I've gone on, I've just been like, man, this is worth so much more than just the money I'm paying to bring that person in, get their expertise, help me to do this thing, make sure I'm making good decisions. You know, when it comes to, to even selecting this, this particular property on, we had a team around me. We had people that were, that were talking to me, and I'd say, this is a great idea, let's do this. But that team around me with greater expertise would say, well, you haven't thought about this, this, and this. I don't think it's a good call. And I listened to that help. And there were multiple opportunities, even we had, while I'm on the topic, I'm going off my notes, but there were multiple opportunities we had. If we had ended up in those opportunities, we would have been dead in the water. For all kinds of different reasons. But we've got to be willing to ask ourselves, do I need help? Am I needing help? Because sometimes in life, people use the excuse, well, I've got no one helping me. I'm helpless. No one cares. But you know, that's just pride because you could ask someone for help. There is always someone in your world you can put your hand up and say, I need some help. I need help. Some help. And you know, the position of humility seems weak to the world, but in the kingdom, the position of humility is actually the strongest place. Because in Proverbs 22, sorry, Proverbs 15 and verse 22, says, without counsel, look at it, plans fail. (laughs) They fail, but with many advisors, they succeed. In the coming season, what help could you ask for? What help could you engage in? I'm excited. Out of this series, we're going to start, and it's probably going to come around the fall. I'm excited to start a class, a specific stewardship, financial resources, and management class in our church. And so it's it's all about getting help. The basics of making all this stuff happen. We're going to offer a class of, I don't know, three, four, six weeks. I don't know how much much time Bob's got available. Um, (laughs) We'll do it together. But do I need help? Am I asking for help? And I believe these are keys to helping us be great, great stewards in Jesus' name. Question five. 
Have I left room to grow? Have I left room to grow? Is there margin in my life? Is there margin in my world? Last week, I asked the question, do you leave things to chance? Here's a new question. Do you run things down to zero? Or is there room to grow? Is there margin built in? You know, margin is a kingdom thing. You know, in the Old Testament, you can go back and read it, but God instructed his people, do not harvest all the way to the fence. Leave a little bit for the poor. Leave some margin in your world to be a blessing to someone else. Are you the type of person, maybe you run things all the way to zero? Can I just encourage you? If you live that way where you're just running on empty all the time, could there be kingdom possibilities that you're missing out on because you haven't left margin to be able to look at it, to be able to take it, to be able to seize that opportunity because you've got margin there, but the opposite of that is, well, I'm just trying to make it all work, go month to month, just trying to make it all work. Have I left room to grow? Is there margin in the moment? There's financial margin. I love financial margin because that speaks to having a buffer and having emergency funds and maybe some assets put away. That's very, very good stuff. But you know, there's margin in all kinds of areas of our life. There's margin in relationships. In my marriage, I can build margin into my marriage where it feels like um, with my wife, I actually have a bit of extra time. Time is an area of our lives that we feel like we don't have enough of. But you know, we can build margin into our time. So we're not late all the time. So we actually show up a little bit early. Here's the thing about time. You can have your time serve you or you will serve your time. And have I left room to grow? Have I left margin in my world? See, great managers know this. And oh man, this is so important. Is margin gives me options. If I've left room to grow, it means that There's possibility. It means something comes along and you look at it and you're like, man, with wisdom, you look at it and say, that's an opportunity. But if I've got no margin, no room to grow, I can't even look at that. I can't even do anything with it. So God is calling us to to leave room for further growth. So that's question number five. What am I up to? Question, Question six. When is enough enough? Because here's the truth this morning is Jesus is enough and it's not worth losing at all. God's never going to make you go somewhere and do something that he hasn't called you to. And when he calls you, listen to me carefully, he graces you for that. And that means management. That means stewardship. But pursuing a return, listen to me very carefully, pursuing a return For the master will never mean that you should take yourself to the end of yourself to get at something for yourself. When is enough enough for you? You know, that's a good question to just ask. I believe in every season. Maybe you're in here today and you're trying to live like a five-talent guy, but you're a two-talent guy. When is enough enough? When when do we get to the place where we say, you know what, if if I can't get all that, am I still happy here? When is enough enough? When am I at the place where I realize that God's given me so much already? Look at Mark chapter 8. I love it when the keys come in and everything just sounds more holy. (laughs) Mark chapter 8. This is Jesus. He says, For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? In the message, it says this. It says, what good would it do to get everything you want and lose you, the real you? What could you ever trade your soul for? When is enough enough? When do we get to the point when I'll be content with what I have now? Here's the truth this morning, friends. Is that I may be believing for big things and wanting to see amazing stuff down here. But if I'm not content with what God has given me here, I will never be content when I get there. I will never find contentment in that season if I haven't found it already here. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 6 says, But with godliness, sorry, but godliness with contentment, look at it, is great gain. Great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, we can take nothing out of the world. 
But if we have food and clothing, look at these words, with these we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires. Look at the impact on others that plunge people into ruin and destruction. Enough is enough. God will bring about the increase. But contentment is the great base to build your life off. Contentment is the level that God wants to set. And he says to you, are you happy here? Are you happy because I should be enough for you? Are you happy here? When is enough enough? You see people chasing this, this dollar bill all the time. I spent some time in the corporate world and man, you look at these people and they're so unhappy. Got everything literally the world can offer and just not happy. When is enough enough? Going to take another property or another car we buy or another thing we can get a hold of. Maybe it's the next overseas destination. I don't know what it is, but we've got to answer that question as faithful stewards of the kingdom. When is enough enough? And have we got enough now? Because I believe we have, because we have Jesus. And the last question is this, as the team joins me. Question number seven, and then I'm done. Is this going to bless others? This increase, this thing I'm believing God's going to give me, this, this mountain that I'm going to climb, which will be my return that I bring back to the master, and he says, good job, well done. Is that actually going to bless others or just bless me? Is this going to build the church or just build me? Yes, God wants you to steward well. But this is the truth today. This is the character of God. He wants to bless you so you will bless others. He wants to bless you so everywhere you go, every sphere of life, every interaction you have, you bless other people. Because somehow in God's goodness and how amazing God is, He invites us to be part of His plan. Like what? What is that all about? God doesn't have to do this, but He wants to. And we know this because in Genesis chapter 12, this is where it all comes from. It says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land I will show you. Verse 2, I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. And I will, I will bless those who bless you and I will dishonor. And to him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed, double or nothing. You know, the cool thing about God is that He wants to bless you and you, you get the blessing. You get to enjoy the blessing. I don't know about you, but in my human fleshness, that's pretty cool. I get to enjoy what God is blessing me with, but you know that's not the point. The increase, the favor, the goodness, the... The cycle where everything comes around and you see big profit and great things. It's all intended to do one thing, to bless you, but to bless someone else. To reach you and to reach someone else. That's the whole point of our church, is that we would reach more people. Yes, we would reach you. Yes, you would be blessed, but you will be a blessing to other people. Our church will be a blessing to the world around us. Is this going to bless just me? or bless others. That's what a good steward asks. Who gets the benefit? Is it just me, or is it many, many other people? Double or nothing. That's what the master wants. You know, he's not just looking for money. This is about money. Make no mistake, when you, when you study talents in the Bible, it is about money. Don't tell me it's not about money. But here's the point. It's about people. It's about impact on others. It's about resource going out. It's about people being blessed by the fact that you are blessed. By, by your obedience and your faithfulness and your stewardship, it becomes double or nothing because, yeah, you'll be blessed, but so many other people will be as well. 
Would you stand with me? I want to pray for some people this morning. Well, hey, I hope you received something from that message. I wonder if you've ever received Jesus as your Lord and Savior. I'd love to include you in a prayer. The Bible tells us that all we have to do is believe in our hearts, confess with our mouths that Jesus Christ is Lord, that God raised Him from the dead and we are saved. We actually don't have to do anything except receive this beautiful gift from God. So I wonder if you've ever made that choice to invite Jesus in. I would love to lead you in a prayer right now. Why don't you just repeat after me? Dear Jesus, thank you that you love me. Thank you that you died for me and you rose again. Forgive me of my sins, of all the things I've done wrong. I choose today to be a child of God. In Jesus' name, amen. We really believe in that moment. If you pray that prayer from your heart, you move from not knowing God to knowing God. You're saved. And we would love to help you in any way we can in the journey. Please reach out to us at colonialchurch.life and we'll do everything we can to help you on this beautiful new journey of faith. God bless you.